Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Chiradeep. Uh, I work for Citrix. I'm an architect with uh, Citrix, and I work on uh, CloudStack. And this is something I've been, if you heard of Google's 20% uh, time, they give 20% employees to work on their pet projects. This is something I've worked on my minus 10% time, which means I had no time to work on it. Uh, but I did learn something, and I wanted to share those learnings with you. This is a, uh, a developer talk. Um, so you are, if you're not a developer, your eyes might cloud over. Um, I thought I was going to give a demo, but uh, there's something wrong with my setup. Uh, but largely, the, the attempt is to make you think about uh, how you want to contribute to CloudStack and uh, where you want to run uh, your service. So I'll talk about what is StackWatch, uh, how I designed it, and uh, some lessons learned, and then uh, tips for uh, building your own service in, in CloudStack. So uh, StackWatch is uh, we're strictly modeled around a uh, similar sounding name from Amazon uh, called AWS CloudWatch. And that essentially is a monitoring as a service. So you have your app uh, running in the cloud. And you want to be able to monitor things like you know, request latency or uh, memory pressure or anything that, can, that you can think of, you want to be able to monitor at a very fine uh, granularity and then be able to retrieve those uh, metrics at a later time. Maybe 15 days later, you want to see, well, what happened uh, two weekends ago. Um, you want to be able to graph them, get the averages, statistics, et cetera. And very importantly, you want to be able to alarm when there's uh, threshold crossings. Either you know the load's too high, or, the, uh, or you know, corresponding the loads drop to an acceptable level. And uh, because you're running in a uh, multi-tenant cloud, as imagine that you have you know a thousand or ten thousand tenants, and they're each sending a hundred events or hundred metrics a minute. Um, that's a million metrics a minute you're trying to handle. That right. So that these are some of the requirements for uh, StackWatch. And the, the way it came about was that uh, CloudStack has this auto-scaling mechanism. And there was somebody complaining about that, hey, you know, I, I like the feature, but I need to deploy a NetScaler to take advantage of it. I don't want to use a NetScaler. Besides, just not, my application's not even load balanced. So why should I buy a NetScaler? Uh, Tuna put in something uh, which uses HA proxy, but that still requires a load balancer in the uh, in the, in the path. So then I looked at, well, how does Amazon do it? Um, and Amazon lets you use application metrics, the metrics that really matter, right? I mean, so what if your uh, hypervisor is reporting your CPU is high? Uh, what really matters is what your application thinks is the load, right? Um, and then the current implementation uses a lot of polling, which really doesn't scale if you want the million uh, uh, metrics a minute kind of thing. Um, and then if you wanted fidelity to the AWS uh, API, again, that was not there in CloudStack. And, and then some people said, well, you know, sure, you can scale up by starting a new VM or, or scale down by stopping a VM, but what if I want to do something else? Maybe I want to increase the, my Java memory or heap or something, right? So they wanted more flexibility. But all that indicated that the, uh, it, the, if I were to do the auto scale service again, I would need a new or a, a service like CloudWatch, which is what I call StackWatch. And then uh, along the way, because you know, uh, I, I read an article that saying that a learning mind is, is essential to keep your brain fr uh, young and fresh, I said, why don't I develop this in a different language, right? Uh, um, and then um, because I was doing this on a uh, minus 10 percent time, you know, I'd code on this like 20, uh, two, to, two to three times a week, and then every time you sync up with uh, the master, it's moved ahead so much that you do a lot of yak shaving just trying to get up, catch up with the code, right? So, so here's I'm going to go in a little bit of digression. So, if, if when I adopted my uh, learning hat, I thought, well, what is the new developer coming into CloudStack going to think? What if we, they're trying to attack the same problem? Are they going to put the code into CloudStack, or they, are they not? Um, and, it, and, it, and you realize that it can be intimidating, right? I mean, there's so many features in CloudStack. You don't know where exactly to put your service in. You're scared that you might break something. There's a long review process. And then what if I don't like Java, right? 
Um, and then I read another article about, uh, about the internet, and there it talks about the narrow waist of the internet. And if you look at it uh, like an hourglass, you got a, a plethora of protocols at the physical layer, ethernet and copper, fiber, ethernet, whatever, right? And then at the top you have, a, a, again, a profusion of protocols which solve specific uh, unique problems. But right at the middle is the IP layer. And the IP layer is hard to change. People have tried to change it. Uh, there's been several attempts to do like a Internet 2 or Internet 3, but it still hasn't changed because it's so damn hard to change, right? So if you think about, apply the same model to Apache Cloud Stack, you have the ACS core, which uh, Alex described a couple of talks ago in, in great detail. You have a, uh, the lower end, the, the technology, which is you know, the hypervisors, the SDN, the, uh, and, and then you'll find a lot of talks about talking about how, they, how people are integrating their technologies into ACS. And then at the top, you have services built on top of ACS. Right? So is it uh, load balancing or DB as Stackmate, which is going on in the uh, adjacent room there? Maybe you want to build a PaaS. And, and, the, and then compared to doing stuff at the top or at the bottom, ACS core is, is a little hard to change. But then the question becomes, oh, I'm going to do monitoring as a service or auto scale as a service. Where should I put my code? You know, should it be in the ACS core or should it be on the top or should it be at the bottom? So uh, to, uh, to make you think even more deeply, so today if you look at um, how CloudStack uses the virtual router, and it's, it's almost like magic, right? I create a network. CloudStack has internal APIs into, into services internally to ACS, which you never see, um, which magically creates a virtual router VM, configures it, and then it's present, it's, it's ready for you to use, right? And it's, uh, as a uh, consumer of the API, I just love it. I mean, it just, it just works. And as magically, I've got all these services running for me. Um, but as a developer, it's a little bit challenging. Now I say, okay, I want to make some changes to this magic. It's hard, right? There's uh, fiddly scripts there. There's interactions between different services. You don't know what you're going to break. Or if you look at this model, let's say, uh, you do, do create a network, uh, but ACS does not. It just creates a network object. And then there's this VR service which is running outside of ACS, which now calls the uh, create VM API. And then the VR interacts with that VR service. Now if you were a developer, you would say feel confident about mucking around with the VR service because you're pretty confident that you're not affecting the rest of ACS. But as an end user or a consumer, you're like, God, I got to start orchestrating with two APIs now. I got to deploy two services. I got to do HA and state maintenance for two different services. That's a pain. So I'm trying to illustrate there's a, uh, a design balance between usability and maintainability, which you have to think about any time you want to introduce a new service into, into CloudStack. And, and, and uh, of, of late, the industry is talking about an extreme form of this called microservices. And there's an interesting blog by Martin Fowler about this, where you design software applications as suites of independently deployable services. So instead of ACS core, you could imagine uh, 20 different services, each of them responsible, one for virtual machine, one for host, one for account. And then all they're, inter they're interacting using REST APIs and not an in-memory model. It's controversial. It's not exactly service-oriented architecture, but it's one step further. And, and CloudStack has rightly been described. If you look at the microservices model, CloudStack is a monolith because it runs in one JVM. And, and that brings some disadvantages. Change is hard. Uh, and that, that's what we've been working two years uh, to make it easier to change it. But if you put your service into CloudStack, you automatically get a bunch of stuff. You get horizontal scale, throttling, API, monitoring, everything comes for free. 
And then if you, if you introduce a service and then you're saying, well, maybe it's not the right design, you just go to Eclipse and do the refactoring and then it's done, right? In a microservice, typically the model is, I don't like the service, I throw away the code and write a new service. And I can write it in any language and I can use any database I want. I don't really care about what the other services are doing. And there's uh, disadvantages to that which you can read in Martin Fowler's blog. So the, these are the two extremes, whether it's the monolith versus microservice. Now, so let's look at what Amazon's done. Their service boundaries are defined by API endpoints. So they have an EC2 endpoint, they have an autoscale endpoint, CloudWatch, ELB, but not for VPC, not for Elastic IP, nothing like that, right? So, so that gives us a, a useful starting point about how to structure your service. So now look, let's look at how I designed StackWatch. As I said, I didn't want to use Java. And I use, actually used a language called Clojure, which is a JVM language, but it's not Java. So StackWatch is a, a Clojure uh, task or process that runs outside of CloudStack. And then you can uh, uh, apply the CloudWatch APIs into StackWatch. And it's, it has its own uh, MySQL database to store uh, metadata like uh, the alarms you're interested in, the metrics. And in order to authenticate the user, it uses the cloud credentials from CloudStack. So now, now remember, you, you're getting a million API calls into StackWatch a minute. And we are going to authenticate each of these calls. So it's better to cache those credentials once you get it from CloudStack. And then uh, in order to store these uh, metrics at a very fine fidelity for a long time, we use, I use something called OpenTSDB, which is a, uh, another open source project, which uses HBase as a backend. And to get alarms or threshold crossing, I use another high performance streaming process called, uh, process called Riemann. So now you can see that there's um, at least three different processes running here. Uh, OpenTSDB is a uh, stands for Open Time Series Database. It's a front-end Apache HBase, and uh, it, it's capable of storing billions of data points. So if you wanted to store uh, metrics for a whole year, you could do that with, uh, with, with OpenTSDB. You could use something like RRDs, but uh, RRDs are going to start uh, summarizing your information as soon as there's no space left to store your RRDs, right? But uh, with something like OpenTSDB, you could store it indefinitely at any, any fidelity that you want. And it's scalable and it's reliable because it's HBase. Riemann is another uh, open source project with the Eclipse license, and it's designed as a stream process. And there's a bunch of other stream processes that I could have used. There's Esper, there's um, Apache Storm, but this was uh, appealed to me because it was designed. It is a single process, and it is designed as an infrastructure monitor. And uh, I use this to generate the alarms back into Stackwatch, uh, so that Stackwatch can then pass those alarms onto the autoscale engine. This is what it looks like. And from the left hand side, you're getting um, events from, you know, metrics about your CPU, memory, disk, or whatever your app metrics are comes into Riemann, it, it uh, applies some algorithms, decides what's interesting, what event's interesting, and then it sends out alerts or uh, a pluggable engine at the, at the right-hand side to do whatever you want it to do. Um, here's an example of the, it's got a, a domain-specific language where you can configure it to, uh, to generate the alarm. Here's an example, this is actually closure code um, this will uh, send out a, an email if there's a threshold crossing on your request latency. So, uh, so Stackwatch, as I said, is just a front end. It's an API front end. It knows how to do the Amazon API. Um, it stores uh, metric metadata in MySQL. And then it does the API authentication using signatures, using uh, data it fetches from CloudStack. And I wrote it in Clojure because I thought I wanted to run it in the same uh, JVM as, the, as Riemann, but that turned out to be a wrong assumption. But anyway, I learned something new. So what happens is that um, the, uh, the Amazon API comes in, 
uh, this is what the, uh, the CLI looks in if you want to insert a uh, particular metric into CloudWatch. It, it, this is a, uh, the request latency for a web front end. You give it the timestamp, you give it some uh, tags and, and the value. This gets sent into uh, OpenTSDB, and the TSDB has two APIs you can use. You can use a Telnet-like API or a REST API. We send it and it stores it in there. And then uh, Riemann has an API as well, which is based on uh, Protobuf, and then we can send it in Riemann, and then Riemann can send alarms back to Stackwatch. So the, uh, so the only point of integration of StackWatch and CloudStack is the, uh, the user credentials. And, and we use this API called uh, getUser. And then once we get the user, we have the account UUID, and then we can start storing uh, data in StackWatch tagged with that account UUID. And so there is no um, foreign key relationship with CloudStack's databases but there's an implicit foreign key based on the UUID, right? And so if I now wanted to say, well, what are the alarms that belong to me? I could use my account UUID and find it instead of, instead of doing a, a SQL join inside CloudStack's database. So um, the current status for uh, uh, StackWatch, it's written as a uh, closure web app. Um, but the intention is to scale to a million events per minute. I have not tested it. I don't have the infrastructure to test that kind of stuff. Um, I got a, a handful of APIs at work. Uh, you can put the metric data. It goes into Riemann and OpenTSDB. You can list your metrics, and it, you can fetch some uh, graphs from uh, OpenTSDB. There's no web UI. Uh, it was not, that was not my intention of this project. And so, but if you remember, my motivation was to start with uh, autoscale, and I never actually got around to doing it. Um, but if I were to do it, since I got this idea of doing stuff outside of CloudStack, here's one way I might have done it. I would have written it as a Ruby on Rails app. Remember, this is not a high-performance API. Um, I would implement all the uh, autoscale APIs that are needed, um, stored in a separate database. I can use the get user API from CloudStack to authenticate the API. Uh, store the credentials as before in a cache. Uh, send the alarm configuration to StackWatch, and the StackWatch would send me back uh, threshold alarms. And then I would uh, call uh, CloudStack's uh, end user API, deploy VM, list VM, et cetera, to, to actually deploy the VMs. And the, all the interactions here would be using the public APIs, right? It's all authenticated. It's all that uh, it can be over the network or inside the same uh, host, but your, uh, the APIs are going over the network instead of in process. Um, so uh, I learned some lessons, and uh, here's the, here they are. So if you're using a services-oriented architecture like I showed, um, it's easy to do rapid prototyping and evolution. I did not have to um, you know, synchronize with the Apache Master more than you know, a couple of times a month. Um, you can use your favorite language if you needed to. And uh, use the appropriate framework, right? I mean. HBase is a database which CloudStack does not use. Now you want to use it. And so this is a useful way of doing it. And, uh, and then maybe you want to use some uh, open source project which is not compatible license-wise with Apache CloudStack. And so that's another way, uh, way to do it. But then what I found was that I just had to do a lot of the act shaving. I had to reinvent API validation, parsing, and authentication, and that took a lot of time. I mean, it was already done in CloudStack, but then I had to do it again. And then, you know, how do I deploy it? How do I exchange keys with CloudStack? How do I, I just suddenly have six different services? How do I deploy it so that um, it's easy to deploy, maintain, upgrade? Um, and then if you wanted a unified UI, well, how would you do it across two different endpoints? So 
It threw up more questions, but these are questions to be solved uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, uh, as, a, as a design point. Um, but I felt that, um, at least from the performance perspective, it was useful to run this as a separate service. Um, some of the things I might do in the future in my uh, minus 10% time, I might uh, um, test metric insertion at scale, uh, finish the support for the complete CloudWatch API, and then um, maybe even work on the auto scale service. So um, the, uh, the lessons learned were um, when do you want, or the questions I want you to think about are when do you want to run it as a separate service or put it in Apache code? One is you don't want to code in Java. That, that question is uh, obvious. You can't put it in ACS, uh, so run it as a separate service. Second point is that your requirements are not clear. You don't know what you want to do or your requirements are fuzzy. It's really going to be really hard to start prototyping that in Apache Master. Right, so maybe you want to start writing it as a separate service when you're firm on the, um, the design details and then you can move it in, back into Apache Cloud Stack. Maybe your audience is different. Your cloud operator is different from your database operator, right? So it's a different uh, uh, community that you're selling to. Um, and then if you can do stuff with the existing API, like you saw that you know, Autoscale could use the existing API, why not do it as a separate service? Or your, your service has a niche need which nobody else needs. I mean, uh, there was a requ request the other day that, hey, I want to monitor all the hosts in my uh, data center and then patch them when they, when they go out of patch validation. Is that Apache core, uh, ACS core? I don't think so. So you would run that as a separate service. Or you have some uh, favorite package that you want to use that um, is incompatible with the Apache license. So you run it as a separate service. The case for in-process service is, is strong as well. Uh, you, you get a put in the community. There's lots of people using it all the time, testing it all the time. And then especially if the operational envelope, whether it's uh, how you back it up, how you uh, upgrade it, et cetera, is the same as Apache Cloud Stack, then it's a good fit for coding inside Apache Cloud Stack. Or, you know, the public API is insufficient. You need access to the internal APIs, internal tables, um, then, you know, but you, I would consider enhancing the public API first for that. And some reasons why you might want to do it, but they're not good enough reasons. You want to reuse some of the stuff that Cloud Stack gives you, like clustering or, um, UI plugins, or you want uh, you you feel that you want a uh, join with uh, an existing table. Uh, these are not strong enough reasons to put it in an Apache core. Uh, you should consider doing it as a separate service. And some of the niche examples I've seen are, um, as I said, the hypervisor patching service. Uh, one way to do it is that you just use the admin API to retrieve the host details, run a service which pulls each hypervisor once a day, and then apply a patching service. You want to integrate with the data center monitoring or CMDB, again, use the admin APIs uh, to do that. You can use the events API to do that. Uh, you want to do some kind of real-time uh, reporting correlation. Again, it's probably not core to cloud stack, so do it outside. Somebody has already wanted to do spot pricing, and that's a totally, you know, something you can easily run outside cloud stack just using the cloud stack APIs. Um, here are some uh, references uh, for you guys, and uh, uh, I would recommend uh, Martin Fowler's blog and also uh, before you code up a separate service, uh, read the fallacies of uh, distributed computing. Um, you know, when you're a programmer, you assume that the network is always reliable, that your packets are going to get across in, 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 in a finite amount of time. Um, that never happens, or it, it happens maybe 99% of the time, but you have to write code for the 1% of the time. And um, 
don't search for narrow waist model on Google. At least not at work. Um, any questions? So the question is, who's actually doing the application uh, metric performance? So uh, if you go back to the, uh, the way you insert the metric is this uh, mon put data. So let's say your application has a, uh, typically your um, application has well-defined metric collection point uh, at your, um, if you're running a Java service, for instance, then you could have a filter in your servlet which measures request latency, right? And so that service would then use the, the CloudWatch API to send that data to CloudWatch. In that, in that case, the expectation is to change the existing applications to... Exactly, yeah. That's how the AWS uh, also works, the cloud That's correct, yeah. Okay, thank you guys.